and the potential. We've noticed that the equation can be broken up, factorized, in other words, in the radial part and the angular part. The angular part in itself can be resolved into a polar part and then is into the polar. And we worked out the wave functions. The radial part will turn into recitations and the polar part will turn into previous polar and azimuthal part will turn into previous lecture. So, <clears throat> so what we realized was that the total wave function psi which is now a function of r, theta, and phi, is characterized by three variables, m, l, and m, l. And it's factorized as a product of a radial part, which only depends upon radius, and polar part, theta, which only depends upon theta, and an azimuthal part, which depends upon small phi. This is characterized by the quantum number ML, the polar part is characterized by the quantum number L, and R is characterized by two quantum numbers, small n and L. Correct? So, we also noticed that the combination of the polar and the azimuthal part is in fact a special kind of function called a spherical harmonic function, which is characterized by L and L. harmonic functions, which are the solution to the angular part of the wave function. Of course, they don't depend upon the radius. They only depend upon the angles. And they have special forms. First of all, we notice that L can take up integer values all the way up to n minus 1. ML for a given L, takes up the values from minus L, minus L, minus L plus 1, minus L plus 1, which means minus L plus 1, minus L plus 2, all the way up to L minus So they are constrained from the values of L and ML, and this is something that I showed you, uh, even though uh, barely in the previous lecture. So you should also go through the handout that I've uploaded, which we skimmed through in the previous lecture. So these spherical harmonic functions are what are generally called the orbitals in atomic hydrogen. For example, the function y 0 0, which is a function of theta and phi, here the superscript denotes the value of L, the subscript denotes the value of m L. In your book, the order is reversed, but I would prefer L to be the superscript and m L to be the subscript. So this y L sub m L for L 0, m L 0, this is just a constant, this is proportional to some constant. Of course, there has to be a normalization constant as well. Right? So, this is proportional to, it's independent of theta and phi. And this is what is generally called an S orbital, which is totally spherically speaking. It does not depend upon theta or on phi. The spherical harmonic function, given L equals 1, ML equals 0, function of theta and phi is proportional to cosine of theta. Alright? So if I would like to plot this, this is my x-axis, my y-axis, my z-axis. If I would like to plot this wave function, now I can plot this wave function because it's a real point. It's real. This particular spherical harmonic is real. Now, if theta, of course, in the polar coordinates is the angle of co the angle from the z axis. Now, I have a function 
which is proportional to cosine theta, which means which is maximum at theta equals 0 and is 0 at theta equals 90 degrees. So I would like to draw a function that exhibits this fact. This is a polar diagram. A polar diagram means that the diagram in which each point, the distance of each point from the origin denotes the strength of the function. So as I vary theta, theta is maximum when uh, the function is maximum and theta is 0. So I get maximum amplitude, I get maximum distance from the origin at the z axis. And also I get maximum distance from the origin when theta equals pi. The only difference is, is that in this top loop, the wave function is positive and in this bottom loop, the wave function is negative. This is generally called an easy orbital. So these orbitals are nothing but solutions to the polar and azimuth, that is the angular part of the wave function in a spherically symmetric situation. If, if I would like to plot y l equals 1, m l equals plus 1, let us see if I can plot this. Now this <coughs> is proportional to <coughs> minus sin theta e plus i phi. Now I can't really plot this because it is a complex number. Okay. My y 1 minus 1 as a function of theta and phi is proportional to plus sin theta e minus i phi. These spherical harmonic functions are tabulated in numerous places. They are also tabulated in the Now I can't plot this on my own because it's a complex number. I can of course plot its real part, I can of course plot its imaginary part, I can plot the real and imaginary part of this. So if I were to take the superposition of these wave functions, remember these are wave functions. They correspond to the angular part of the wave function. The other part of the wave function is as radial. So if I take these two wave functions and form a superposition, there are two kinds of superpositions I can make. One is the sum of these wave functions and the other is the difference of these wave functions. Alright? So remember these are also ideal functions of the Hamiltonian with some radial part. So if I take the sum of these wave functions y1 plus 1 plus y1 minus 1, of course I need to take normalize as well. But I am not caring about the normalization factor because I am just putting in a proportionality in here. Okay. So if I Uh, if I add these up, I get minus sine theta e i phi plus e minus i phi. Now this is proportional to, ignoring the iota part, this is proportional to minus sine theta sine phi. I can ignore the minus part as well because I right. Okay. Now if I were to plot this function, this is my x-axis, my y-axis, my z-axis. You will notice that when theta equals 0, the function is 0. So I do not have any wave function on the z-axis. The wave function is totally distributed uh, predominantly in the equatorial plane. It's also non-zero outside the equatorial plane, but it's predominantly the equatorial plane where this object is maximum. So when theta equals 90, it's maximum, and it also varies with the azimuth angle. When phi equals zero, the wave function is zero. So it's generally a lobe that is centered around the y-axis. Uh, that we generally encounter 
is simply the superposition of these two spherical harmonic quantums. It is also customary to draw instead of uh, instead of wave functions the modulus squared, which are really the probability density functions, the angular probability density functions. So if you plot this this wave function, this wave function modulus squared will be positive in both regions and it will just be the square of this of this orbit. Okay. Likewise if you take the difference of these spherical harmonic functions you will get the Px orbit. For higher values of L, for L equals 2, ML has different possibilities. You can have 0, you can have plus minus 1, plus minus 2. These are the 5D orbitals. Okay, and you can also plot the shapes. What do they look like? So these orbitals for the hydrogen atom are nothing but the spherical harmonic functions. They are ideal functions of the Hamiltonian. Alright. So this gives you a motivation of why we need to study these spherical harmonic functions. Sir, I am by one one per pair modulus per pair to be collected. Is that? Yes, sir. Is that modulus plus sine theta square or zeta? Sine theta square or zeta. So, we should have to plot it. X-axis, y-axis, sine theta square and you will get a donut. This is just a cross section. So when you look at it from the top, you will get a, a donut shape. So something that is maximum, that is spread out only in the equatorial plane. And it's continuous because it does not depend upon phi. So, so you will get a donut in the equatorial plane. This is a plot of y11 one, one mod square. And it's also a plot of y11 one minus 1 mod square. Okay, you will get a donut shape. So this function on its own is a donut inside the epidural Okay. So all of these orbitals are characterized by a value of L and ML. And if you notice from this relationship, these <coughs> quantum numbers ring a bell because they correspond to angular momentum angular momentum quantum numbers have similar relationships. What we realized in the previous course in quantum mechanics 1 is that the orbital, uh, the uh, quantum number j that corresponds to the total angular momentum can take up values 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on, right? And for each value of j, and it can also take up half integer values, 3 by 2, right, 5 by 2, 3 and so on, right. So this was our possible values of j. For each value of j, mj vary from minus j all the way up to j, right. So these were our quantum numbers and we denoted our angular momentum quantum states by j and j. And we were able to describe two operators, j square, and this uh, quantum state is an eigen state of this operator. And another eigen state, the same eigen state is also an eigen state of the operator j z, which means that j square and j z mutually commute. They have a common set of eigenstates. And this Jz has eigenvalues h bar mj. And j and mj are mutually constrained in this way. So now our quantum numbers L and ML seem to be seem to have the properties of angular momentum quantum numbers. So we should be able to describe operators corresponding to these quantum numbers. And we will notice that we will get and the moment of operators once again. So now this is something I would like to motivate. What are the quantum uh, operators associated with small f and ml? So 
now I would like to invoke the concept of orbital quantum, orbital angular moment. by 
over h bar, it's a translation to minus x d phi. So I put a plus a plus x d phi. Now all of this is achieving a rotation about the z axis. What our goal is, I would like, I would like to find an operator for this rotation along the z axis and a corresponding generator of this rotation. We know that the Hamiltonian is a generator of time evolution. We know that the linear momentum is a generator of linear transmissions. We would like to know what is the generator of uh, rotations. Right? We already have an idea that the angular momentum operator is a generator of so we would like to reinforce this concept that here we are doing the rotation of the z axis, the generator must be an angular momentum operator. Let's see what kind of angular momentum operator we get here. Now if I look at this expression and if I expand I get I n t minus i Translation operator identity minus i dx <coughs> some a over h bar and this acts on cat x. I get x minus a, correct?
Now, if I were to take all of this as an operator, there's no harm in putting, <coughs> replacing this x and y. This x and y can be replaced by operator and put minus delta h bar. x minus x p by plus y p x. Thank you.
if the rotation operator gives you a positive angle, this must also give you a positive displacement. I think this is positive. Expand this as a data series expansion. Expand this as a data series expansion. You work out, you find that it only works out. This is positive. So this is positive. This is the final expression that I get for R Z through B phi acting on an initial state X Y Z. All right. So this is my new state. Okay. Now the new state is basically a rotated state, rotated through Z. Now this automatically pops out a generator for the rotation. And what is that operator? Generator for the rotation is simply this operator. Okay. In this step what we've done is we will place the variables x and y by their corresponding operators. And we can change their position with respect to these momentum operators because anything along x commutes with anything along y. Correct? Px of course does not commute with x, but Px does commute with operator y. Py does not commute with hat y, but it commutes with hat x. So what I've done here is I've replaced these variables x and y by the corresponding operators. That I can do because I know that if I have a state x, y, z, x hat acting on this state is simply the number x multiplied by the state x, y, z. That I can always do. So what I've done here is I've replaced these variables by the corresponding operators. That's legitimate to do because of this. And I've swapped the position because p x commutes with hat y. Here p y commutes with hat x. And this is the new operator that I did. This operator I call an angular momentum operator along the z-axis, Lz. More specifically, it's called an orbital angular momentum operator because it corresponds to rotation in three dimensions, rotation in the Euclidean space. Therefore, I call it as one of the components of the orbital angular momentum operator. So this Lz, so this uh, expression I can also write as identity minus iota Lz over h bar times the amount of rotation we find x by z and if you, I would like to do an arbitrary rotation rz to an arbitrary angle say beta this would simply be equal to not approximately but equal to e is to minus i beta l z over h bar so l z <coughs> is just one of the components of the orbital angular momentum operator. The angular momentum operator L will have three components. It will have a component along x, a component along y, and a component along z. And the components along x, y can be defined analogously. For example, Lx will simply be equal to y at pz minus z py ly will simply be equal to minus z at px minus x pz note this y this minus sign lz we already know this equals uh, x by minus by dx. And all of this can be summed up quite succinctly in this form. The operator L equals the cross product of the operator R, the position vector R, the position operator and the momentum operator P. And its components follow quite straightforward from this cross product. I can also write L as minus iota H R crossed with the del operator. Because this is what the momentum operator really is. 
So I have three components of the orbital angular momentum operator that is given by the three components of this vector product. Now let's move on. <coughs> Now let's look at Lx. Now let's look at the angular matter operator of L. Now let's look at the three components of it. Along i, along x axis, along y axis, along z axis. And if the situation is fairly symmetric, at the outset I don't know which one of these is the x axis, the y axis or the z axis. I can call any one of them any axis. Anyway, a shorthand way of remembering this or what I've written is through the determinant formula. R, which means x components of R, Y, and Z. These are the components of the position operator. Hat, hat, hat. And I, here I have Px, hat, P by hat, and Pz. So this can give me automatically the different components of the orbital angle. There is also another way of representing this to the anti symmetric cancel with that something that will be too much. Let's look at LX. LX is written over there. Now in spherical coordinate systems, we know that there is a relationship. X is equal to R sine theta cosine of phi. Y equals R sine theta sine of phi and z equals r cosine theta. Right? So, y p z minus z p by z. I can write, for y I can write this form. But I need to know what is p z. p z I know corresponds to minus iota h bar partial by partial z. Now this derivative is in the Cartesian form. I need to put this derivative in the spherical form. Okay. Likewise, I have Px. For Px, I do have an x here. I can also have Py. For Py, I do have a y here. So these derivatives have to be written in the polar form. Because what my purpose is, is to write this Lx in spherical form. Okay. Now, if I look at, for example, partial by partial z. I can use a chain rule. How, now, how do I use the chain rule? If I take some candidate function f, now partial f or partial z is basically partial f over partial r, partial r over partial z, plus partial f over partial theta, partial theta over partial z plus partial f over partial phi, partial phi over partial z. 
where f is a function of r to the phi. This is just the chain. Now what I need to find is uh, partial r over partial z, partial theta over partial z, and partial phi over partial z. Now these can be found from here. How? R I know is equal to x square plus y square plus z square. And so partial r by partial z will be x square plus y square plus z square minus 1 by 2 by, by 2 2 z. Correct? So this will simply be z over r. Likewise, partial r over partial x will be z over x, uh, x over r. Likewise, partial r over partial y will be y over r. Okay? So I have partial r over partial z. I have already found that. Term. Now I need to find out partial theta over partial z. Now, how do I find out partial theta over partial z? I simply have this relationship. Now, partial uh, theta over partial z. Want to find a derivative? Okay, this one is the c goes r goes n. This means 1 equals r minus r sin theta partial, partial r over partial theta over partial z, correct? I just take the derivative of both sides with respect to z. r minus r sin theta partial theta partial theta over partial z. Okay, I take derivative with respect to z. Is the derivative 1 minus ये constant है r की वैसे ही आ गया। I want to take a derivative of cosine theta with respect to theta. d d theta of cosine theta is basically d by uh, this is c here. This is d by d theta cosine theta d theta by d. Okay, so this is my partial theta by partial theta, which means my partial theta by partial z is equal to minus 1 over r sin theta. So I have found partial theta over partial g. What I would like to find now is partial phi over partial g. Now how do I find partial phi over partial g? I just take the quotient of these variables x over y is tangent of phi. Now does phi depend upon z? No, it doesn't because it's an angle with z in the equatorial plane. So this is 0. Partial phi over partial z is 0. This means that my partial partial z can be written as partial r equal partial r over partial z is zero r partial partial r partial theta over partial z is minus one over r sin theta partial partial theta this is my partial by partial z g मैंने पार्शियल में पार्शियल जी निकाल दी। अब मुझे एल एक्स के लिए क्या क्या चाहिए? वाई चाहिए, वाई मेरे पास है, पी सी चाहिए, जी मेरे पास है, पी वाई भी चाहिए। अब पी वाई इस पार्शियल 
I want to find out what is P by. For that, I need to find out what is partial by partial by. Sorry? This z over r, I can also write as cosine theta because I would like to go to polar coordinates, right? Z over r is cosine theta. And this partial theta over partial z Uh, 
I, I would like to write tangent of theta as x square plus y square under root divided by z. Is this correct? This is my tangent theta. So, <coughs> इसे पार्शियल आर और पार्शियल टी की गाली करें इसे पार्शियल आर में पार्शियल टी की गाली के अपने क्या करना पड़ेगा जी बुध आर को समझना है ठीक है पार्शियल आर में पार्शियल टी के एक डेरिवेटिव ऑफ बोथ साइड रिस्पेक्ट जी इसी नाम पर पार्शियल आर पे पार्शियल जी इंडो कोस्टिकल प्लस इंडो कोसाइन plus r, partial r by partial g of cosine theta. Now what is cosine theta? Cosine theta is basically equal to z over x square plus y square plus 
plus z square okay. now take the partial derivative of this cosine theta with respect to z it is going to be complicated we get x square plus y square plus z square under root derivative of this is 1 minus z take the derivative of this thing this is 1 over 2 square plus y square plus z square minus 1 over 2 2 z <coughs> divided by x square plus y square plus z square now this is the derivative of cosine theta with respect to z now plug this in here and work out I think you get what, what you need to find is partial r by partial z you get the same result. So my goal is to find partial r by partial z. My goal is not to find partial z by partial r. So if we just take r in subject, we get Let me find out 
partial theta by partial x. So I differentiate both sides now with respect to x. I get theta square theta partial theta partial x. Now 1 over d is just a constant. x square plus y square. I get 1 over 2 x square plus y square to x. Left with x over z, x square plus y square under one. Now what is x over z? <coughs> x is simply r sin theta cosine theta divided by divided by z. I get tan theta cosine phi. Tan theta cosine phi x square plus y square under root we already know is r sin theta r sin theta so this is sin theta over cosine theta this is cosine phi over r cosine theta but there is a secant square theta here this secant theta cancels out with this so I am left with Partial theta by partial x is equal to cosine phi cosine theta divided by r. Okay. Similarly, I can show that partial theta by partial y simply has this cosine phi replaced by sine phi. Sin of phi cosine theta r. Okay, let me do this. In the same fashion, I can find partial phi by partial x, which equals minus 1 over r cosecant theta sin of phi. Partial phi by partial phi equals 1 over r cosecant theta cosine of phi and partial phi by partial z we already know this so I have these six relationships now okay, what does this mean <coughs> let's look at lx lx equals y tz minus z now what is my y? y equals equals this r sin theta sin phi r sin theta sin phi this is my r now what does my phi z equal? minus iota h bar partial by partial z now what is my partial by partial z? for in order to calculate my partial by partial z I will have to make use of this relationship. Let me find out partial by partial z. Partial by partial z is partial partial r partial r by partial z. Okay. Plus partial uh, theta by partial z partial by partial theta, right? Plus partial phi by partial t, partial phi. Now this I know is 0. Partial theta by partial z is here. Minus 1 over r sin theta. This is minus 1 over r sin theta. Partial by partial t. Partial r by partial z is 
disposal in the this cosine filter by partial R. Now this is my partial by partial G. Now, if this is my partial by partial G, I can put this in here. Cosine theta partial by partial R minus 1 over R sine theta partial by partial theta. I also have minus Z. Now, Z is R cosine theta. I also need partial by partial Y. Now, my partial by partial Y. put in a multiplication here. Partial by partial y will have partial r by partial y here. Okay, now what is partial r by partial y? It's sine theta sine phi. Sine theta sine phi partial by partial r plus a partial theta by partial y. What is partial theta by partial y? This is sine phi cosine theta r plus sin phi cosine theta over r partial by partial theta. I also need a partial phi by partial phi, which is this, plus 1 over r cosine theta cosine of phi partial by partial phi. Now this is my Lx in terms of the polar coordinates. And if I do the simplification, the result is quite simple. Lx turns out to be equal to iota h bar sine of phi partial by partial theta plus cotangent of theta cosine of phi partial theta. <coughs> this is my Lx. Now before we meet for the next class, what I would like to request you is to come up with a similar expression, verify this and come up with a similar expression for L by and L z in spherical coordinates. And then we would like to see how this Hamiltonian is related to this orbital angular momentum. But before you come to next class, it's very important that you don't spend time in the, in the classroom deriving this. I have derived this for one uh, component. Please come up with other components. That is, I would like to express L by LZ in terms of the spherical coordinates. Okay, then I would like to talk more about this Hamiltonian and what does this have to do with the angular momentum components. Up to solve the confusion, I think is resolved in the